to your new accountable institutions into what to comply with and what to expect from their duties as an accountable institution. My name is Charles Giel. I'm working in the Financial Sector Conduct Authority. I'm heading up the FICA Supervision Department. I'm joined by my two colleagues, uh, Michelle Ferry and Komotsu Malefe. So the three of us will take you through the presentation today. I'm going to switch off my camera uh, so that you can view the uh, presentations. So the first area that we are looking at deals with why are we need to comply with these obligations. So obviously there's a framework that needs to be in place. And I think it's very important to understand this framework when you um, need to understand the compliance obligations. So we'll start with you as an accountable institution. By you filing a regulatory reports with the FIC, you see the red circle starts with you. Your reports will go to the Financial Intelligence Center or the FIC, as we call them in short. The FIC will analyze those reports that you've submitted to them and enhance it with information that they have. They've got access to various databases uh, and other information. So they will enhance that information that you've reported to them. They will draft a report on it and they will send that report or product, as they call it, to law enforcement agencies. The law enforcement agencies will then initiate an investigation as a result of the intelligence provided by the Financial Intelligence Center. That investigations will hopefully lead to a criminal prosecution and conviction of criminals and that the assets will be frozen and forfeited to the state. Once that's been done, we understand now where the risks are when it comes to money laundering and terrorist financing. And that risk understanding will then assist you again as accountable institution to understand where your focus should be in terms of a suspicious cross-section reporting, in terms of customer due diligence and so forth. And if all of us, all five roles that you see in, in the slide, do our part, it will reduce crime and will also prevent crime. So we as the FECA, the Financial Sector Conduct Authority, is a supervisory body, and it's our responsibility to make sure that you, as an accountable institution, comply with the obligations imposed on you by the FIC Act or Financial Intelligence Center Act. The only um, issue, not an issue, but we've delegated the supervision uh, of authorized users of an exchange to the exchanges, but we do communicate with the exchanges and we do monitor the activities of the exchanges to ensure that they are doing their supervisory role as delegated to them. So the most important legislation that you're going to deal with from um, compliance with the FIC Act is certainly then the Financial Intelligence Center Act. It's Act 38 of 2001. The Act is available on our website, but you can also access it on the Financial Intelligence Center's uh, website. Now, the Act was established to establish the Financial Intelligence Center, set up the powers and obligations of the Financial Intelligence Center, but it also deals with your obligation as an accountable institution. It imp imposes duties on you um, and other persons to prevent money laundering and the financing of terrorism. There are other pieces of legislation that, that uh, is read with the F uh, Financial Intelligence Center Act, and that is your Prevention of Organized Crime Act. And that's the legislation that makes provision for offenses such as money laundering. And it also, um, deals with the forfeit, forfeiture, freezing and forfeiture of proceeds of crime. There's also the promotion of Access to Information Act. We also have the Poktatara Act. Now the Poktatara Act is our act that deals with terrorism. So it also is read with the Financial Intelligence Center Act. So it's important that you look at the Financial Intelligence Center Act to understand your duties as an accountable institution.
So who's an accountable institution? I'll refer to accountable institution. And we as the FECA are responsible for three items as procedural one of the Financial Intelligence Center Act. We're responsible for authorized users of an exchange, as indicated earlier, that that obligation has been delegated by us to the exchanges. However, we still remain responsible for enforcement where, where there is non-compliance by an authorized user. We are also looking at managers uh, registered in terms of the Collective Investment Schemes Act. There's one, only one exclusion, and that is uh, CIS managers in a participation bond. And then item 12, that's an author, uh, authorized financial service provider. There are two exceptions uh, in that case. So if you exclusively provide services, um, that's advice or intermediary services in terms of short-term insurance or health service benefit, you do not need to comply with the obligations of the FIC Act. There are various supervisory bodies, such as the Prudential Authority, um, who is looking at your um, banks and long-term insurers. We also have the Financial Intelligence Center acting as a supervisory body. Now, this is a very nice slide to have. And if you do forget what, I'm, what, we, what we are saying to you today, just remember this specific slide because this it contains all your obligations as an accountable institution. What do you need to comply with? If you look at the far left hand column, that deals with the pillars, the pillars of compliance. So we can group certain compliance obligations into a pillar. The first pillar that you will deal with is customer due diligence. Customer due diligence is divided into various areas. It's divided into anonymous, anonymous clients, the clients acting under false or fictitious names, identification and verification of clients, understanding and obtaining information on business relationships, uh, a, additional due diligence me measures on legal persons, trust and partnerships, ongoing due diligence, doubts about the veracity of previously obtained information, the inability to conduct customary due diligence, foreign prominent public officials, domestic prominent influential persons, their family and close associates. The third column then deals with the relevant sections that you will have to read in the EFIC Act to understand the obligation. So sections 20A up to 21H of the FIC Act then deals with your customer due diligence obligations. And then there have been several guidance issued by the Financial Intelligence Center dealing with the specific compliance obligation. So that last column deals with it. If you see GN, it talks about guidance notes. So on customer due diligence, there are two guidance notes that have been issued, and that's guidance note 7 and 7A. They've also issued PCCs. Now, PCC is also a form of guidance. It is the formal name is a public compliance communication. And several of those have been issued, as you could see, uh, PCCs 26, 31A, 33, 43, 46, 48, 49, 51, and 52. So these guidance explain in layman's terms what your obligation is all about. The second pillar is then record keeping. There are three obligations under record keeping, and that's the obligation to keep customer due diligence records, obligation to keep transaction records, period and format of uh, records to be kept. Your sections is section from section 22 to section 24, and the relevant guidance is guidance note seven. Then the third pillar deals with proliferation of financing. There's a relatively new section in the FIG Act, but it's a very important uh, section as it deals with entities and persons that are identified by the Security Council of the United Nations. Read section 26A to 26C. There's also uh, 20, sections 28A that deals with this obligation. There's a directive, a guidance that, and a PCC issued on proliferation. Then we've got reporting obligations. There are three reporting obligations at this moment. It's a cash threshold transaction report that you need to submit, a property associated with terrorist and related activities, as well as financial sanctions pursuant to UNSC resolutions, and then you've got suspicious and unusual transactions and activity 
the reports that you have to submit. Look at sections 28, 28A and 29, and there have been several guidance issued by the FIC on, on this, on the reporting obligations, and you can just read those guidance as well. The fourth pillar deals with, uh, or sorry, the fifth pillar deals with governance. So it, it's going to deal with your risk management compliance program, the role of the board of senior management, establish a, a compliance function, appointment of a compliance officer, and then training. Read sections 42, 42A, and 43 around these obligations. There have also been several guidance issued in this regard. And then lastly, it deals with registration uh, and registration obligations with the FIC. There's only one section dealing with it, but there's been lots of guidance that's been issued on this issue. So this is the summary of your obligations and where to find it within the FIG Act. We will now proceed to deal with each and every one of these compliance obligations and give you a bit more information as to what it contains. And we're going to start off with Michelle, starting with anonymous persons. Thank you, Michelle. Thank you, Shaul, and good day from my side. Now, with this overview and the summary that Shaul has explained in terms of your duties as an accountable institution, we are going to unpack them one by one to make sure that once this webinar is, is done and dusted and you have it in your back pocket, your understanding has improved. When the FIG Act was amended, and this was in 2017, there was a very distinctive move away very deliberately from a rules-based to a risk-based approach. But there is, is a very important rule that has remained. In terms of the FIC Act, you have a duty to know who your customers are. You are therefore prohibited from doing business, entering into a business relationship with an anonymous person or a person with a fake or a fictitious name. So this is not a negotiable um, or a requirement that you can use your discretion in respect of. This still very much applies and it's very important that you know who your customer is and obviously if the person is anonymous or uses a fake or fictitious name, you're not going to know who the customer is. And how do we then address this? It brings us to your duty to identify and verify the identity of your customer. You have to know who the person is and make sure that the information that you obtain to help you know who the person is that you're onboarding as a customer is in fact true and correct. If you have any doubts about the information that you obtain in this process of identifying your customer, the FIC Act is very clear that you have to do more work to the extent that you can satis satisfy yourself that the person is, in fact, who they say they are. And if you're not able to identify and verify the identity of the customer that you intend to onboard, you can, in fact, not continue with a business relationship with that customer. Knowing your customer and conducting customer due diligence is a very important process that results in you as an accountable institution establishing the nature, purpose and intention of the business relationship that you enter into with the customer, as well as the source of funds. In plain language, why did customer A approach you as an accountable institution? to obtain a financial product from you? And where do they get the money from to pay for this product? You have to obtain information that makes you comfortable and gives you assurance that the person you are dealing with is in fact who they say they are, and they acquire your product and service for the reason that they have explained to you and that that is in fact the truth. And that how this, this um, financing of acquiring financial product or serving service um, where that money in fact comes from so that you are sure that you are not dealing with a person who may be a criminal 
and who wants to abuse your business to launder money or finance terrorism. So it's because every business relationship that you enter into with a customer is unique, please don't apply a generic approach and view all your customers as the same and make similar assumptions at onboarding. Only once you are comfortable that the person is in fact who they say they are, and you know why they want to enter into a business relationship with you, should you continue with a business relationship. It is true then, in this process of conducting customer due diligence and understanding who your client is and understanding why they approached you and they want to enter into a business relationship with you, that you distinguish between the fact that not all customers are natural persons. And criminals do like to disguise their identity and the source of their funds by using and abusing legal persons, trusts and partnerships. It is therefore your duty as an accountable institution to ascertain who is the beneficial owner of your customer when the customer is then not a natural person, when it is in fact a, a PTY limited or a closed corporation or a trust or a partnership. And you have to be clear that beneficial ownership relates not just to ownership, but also speaks to control. And that ownership and control can be direct or indirect. Section 21B of the FIC Act therefore places an obligation on you to conduct what is called additional due diligence on customers who are legal persons, trusts and partnerships. That means you have to do more work, gather more information to ascertain who the beneficial owner is. And the reason you have to do that, again, as I mentioned, is to make sure that that beneficial owner who ultimately benefits from the transactions and the business relationship with you as an accountable institution are in fact not criminals hiding behind a corporate veil. When you onboard a customer, you obtain information about the customer and to understand your business relationship and the source of the funds at the time of onboarding. But this is not a once-off event. Risks evolve, the circumstances of customers change, the, the product ranges and availability of with their own unique characteristics evolve. So you have to keep an eye and monitor this business relationship to make sure that during the course of the business relationship, the transactions that take place are in line with the knowledge that you have about the client. And you do this in the form of conducting ongoing customer due diligence. So this is another one of your duties. And without that, the information and your knowledge about the customer you collected maybe years ago becomes stale. And it could be that the circumstances or the characteristics and vulnerabilities about the product that makes it attractive for money laundering or terror financing um, does not come to the surface and you, you're ignorant about it if you do not continue with conducting customer due diligence throughout the life cycle of the business relationship that you have with the customer. The requirement of conducting ongoing customer due diligence is set out in the FIC Act Section 21, capital C. Speaking about customer due diligence, we are all familiar with the fact that customers are individuals and they are unique, be they natural persons or legal persons in what, whatever way, shape or form. And it could be that a customer that you on board is in fact what is in layman's terms referred to as a politically exposed person. In terms of schedules 3A and 3B of the FIC Act, specific reference is made to foreign prominent public officials and domestic prominent influential persons. Now, this does not mean that you cannot onboard and take on a customer who is in fact 
an FPPO or a DPIP. But certain additional requirements apply because these are generally seen as higher risk customers because of the position that they hold. So, for instance, in terms of FPPOs and DPIPs, as well as their family and known close associates, you would have the duty as an accountable institution to do enhanced customer due diligence and to seek senior management approval before you onboard such a customer. Again, it's not about avoiding risk. It is about managing and mitigating it. So do not necessarily just turn away a person who is maybe the mayor or has some kind of political exposure. Just understand that you have to do more customer due diligence so that you are comfortable, that you understand the customer, you know where the source of funds um, originates from and what the nature, purpose and intention is of the business relationship that they want to enter into with you as an accountable institution by acquiring a financial product or a financial service. With regards to the process of obtaining customer due diligence information, you are inevitably going to have records. And I'm going to ask Gemotso to speak to you about your duties in terms of record keeping. Gemotso? Over to you. Thank you so much, Michelle. As Michelle had in informed you about the collection or obtaining of CDD information, now I will inform you about your duties regarding the storage or the safekeeping of those records. In terms of sections 22 and 22A of the FIC Act, institutions are obliged to, main records, uh, to maintain records of CDD and transactions. So it is important for institutions to have policies, procedures and processes in place relating to the record keeping, access to records, safeguarding as records uh, of records. Is the, are the records going to be done or stored manually or electronically? how long the records will be stored, and importantly, to inform the FSCA and the FIC about any third-party record keeping. To this end, the FSCA has an e-portal where information regarding third-party record keeping can be, be uploaded. Institutions as well should know that they should make use of the FIX Go AML portal in order to update or inform the FIC regarding any third party records. Short but sweet, but now that I've informed you about record keeping, let's get into client screening. On this slide, when I mention Al Qaeda, the Taliban, ISIS, or Osama bin Laden, it should automatically come to you that these are people and groups known for terrorism or terrorist activity. Most recently, you would have heard in the news about the inter international sanctions and embargoes imposed during the Russia-Ukraine war. In terms of Section 26, capital letter B of the FIC Act, institutions are obliged to perform screening in relation to targeted financial sanctions, and secondly, to freeze the property of clients that have been identified as appearing on the targeted financial sanctions list. What does this mean? It means that institutions must scrutinize the United Nations Securities Council 1267 list and the targeted financial sanctions list, which is available on the FIX website, and to determine if their client appears on the set list. This process can be conducted manually or electronically by use of a tool or any other software. This is, however, not being prescribed. If the client reflects on the list to freeze assets, 
there's a requirement or prohibition not to proceed with any transaction. And this is a broad requirement and is applicable to any business in South Africa. In terms of terrorist property, an institution is still required to scrutinize the UN 1267 list and the targeted financial sanction list and to determine whether the institution's client appears on this list. This is a, there is a prohibition as well against the accountable institution to not continue with the transaction or business relationship once it's been established that the client does appear on the list. An accountable institution is required to report property owned or controlled by a person or entity that has been specified on the UNSC 1267 list or the TFS list issued by the FIC. This report is called the Terrorist Property Report and must be filed with the FIC. And now over to Shaw, who's going to tell us more about the information that needs to be provided to the FIC. Thank you, Komotsu. So it's very important, as we've stated, that you continue with that cycle and provide information to the FIC. How do you do that? There's only one way to do it, and that's in an, in an electronic form. Uh, once you've registered with the FIC, and we'll like, later talk about registration, you are able to go onto the FIC's platform called GoAML, and you are able to submit information to the FIC. Um, there are various informations that you can and should submit to the FIC. One of the um, information that you need to submit to the FIC relates to Section 27. Now, Section 27 says that the FIC can approach you as an accountable institution and ask you whether a specific person, persons, are clients of yours. You are then obliged to go back to the FIC to say, yes, the person is a client of mine, or no, the person is not a client of mine. So please make sure that you do respond to the FIC and that you do respond timelessly to the FIC even if you do not have that person as a client of yours. So to inform the, the FIC whether they need to approach you further for information. Now the reporting obligations, as indicated earlier, there are three reporting obligations. It's cash threshold transaction reports, it's property associated with terrorist and related activities, and then there are suspicious transaction reports. So let's start off by dealing with uh, their property reports. Now, Humos has already mentioned it uh, specifically. There are three things that you need to be aware of when you report the Terra property report. You, um, you need to be in possession or in control of property uh, of a person that is listed on the United Nations 1267 list. Now that's the United Nations list of terrorists. Now the terrorists that's on that list relates mostly to the Taliban, Al-Qaeda uh, and ISIS. So you need to screen your clients against that 1267 list and make sure you don't have a person as a client on that list. If you do have the client that's on the list and you do have property under your control of that specific client, you need to submit a report to the FIC. The second thing that you need to consider for a terror property report is if you are aware that the person has committed an offence in the Pokhtatara legislation. Now, remember I said Pokhtatara deals with terrorism. So if you are aware that uh, a person has committed such an offence, and that person is a client of yours, and you have property of that client, you also need to report that to the FIC. The third thing that you need to report to the FIC, um, as Komoso already spoke about, is if you have a person um, as a client 
that appears on the United Nations Security Council's list um, as per the target of financial sanctions. Where do you find that list? The, the target of financial sanction list you can find on the fixed website. Now that um, list on a fixed website are in different formats. It's in PDF, XML and HTML formats, so you can easily search for it. But alter alternatively, you can also make use of a service provider and, and screen um, your clients using software. The second reporting obligation, and that's section 28, that's your cash threshold transactions. Now, a cash threshold transaction um, is again, it's a rule. What do I mean with it? So if you receive or pay out cash to the amount of 25,000 Rand or more, you need to report that to the FIC. Now, if I talk about cash, we, we say it's cash only. It doesn't refer to EFTs uh, or interbank transfers or, or, or checks. It is pure cash. There's also an aggregation element to it. With other words, if the client pays you several amounts of cash um, and it appears to, to you that if you add up all those cash transactions, it amounts to 25,000 Rand, you also need to report that to the FIC. Um, please look at your records on a daily basis to ensure that you um, ought to verify whether you've received cash or pay out cash in order to meet this obligation. The third obligation then is suspicious transaction reports. Now this is, is probably the, the, the most crucial type of report that you, that you can make to the FIC. The suspicious transaction report deals with a suspicion or activity that you've seen in the client's behavior. Now, the FIG Act contains several instances of such behavior, such for instance as it likely to facilitate the transfer of proceeds of crime or has no apparent or business or lawful purpose or is um, done to avoid giving rise to reporting duty or a lesser tax evasion. You have to report that to the FIC. So before you report anything to the FIC, you need to understand why are you filing? What are you filing? How did this transaction or activity happen? When did it happen? So you need to have a date. Who's the person involved? And you had, need to have a location. Just remember that there are, um, we have several types of reports. We've got um, transaction reports, and then we've got activity reports. Now, a transaction report is where a transaction is concluded. You report the transaction. If a transaction has not been concluded, but the activity appears suspicious, you, you file activity report. On the screen, you will see the various types of information that you can report to the FIC. Click on the right um, type of report that you would like to make because then the, the fields of the different types of reports will differ. So the one highlighted now in blue is cash threshold report aggregation. Remember when I spoke about various cash transactions, and if you add them all up, it amounts to 25,000 Rand or more. That deals with cash threshold report aggregation. Uh, and then there are various other reports as well. As you can see, please choose the right one. Once you have reported a transaction, the FIC may come back to you in terms of Section 32 of the FIC Act. But other words, Section 32 says the FIC can ask you for additional information which you need to provide to them. So they can ask you for additional information. Please continue with the transaction. The fact that you've reported the transaction to the FIC does not mean uh, to say that you need to stop now with uh, with the client. You have to stop with the transaction. You need to proceed with the transaction. 
The second thing is uh, do not tip off the client. Uh, don't tell the client I'm reporting you to the FIC because that would be a contravention of the FIG Act. And the third thing that you need to understand is that it's the timing of the report. You need to report whether it's a suspicious transaction, whether it's a cash threshold or a terror property report transaction to the FIC as soon as possible. There are outer limits uh, in terms of your obligation. For instance, a cash threshold transaction, it's not later than two days. So you have to report to the FIC as soon as possible, but not later than two days. A terror property report, you need to report to the FIC as soon as possible, but not later than five days. And a suspicious transaction, you need to report to the FIC as soon as possible, but not later than 15 days. Please don't wait until day number 15 uh, before you report. Remember the obligation is to report as soon as possible. So as soon as possible as you made the, your conclusion that this is suspicious, you have to report that to the FIC. Right, so um, Michelle is going to take us further on the risk management and compliance program. Thank you, Sean. So this entire process that you have to undergo as part of your duties of understanding who your customer is um, and being able to identify reportable transactions and activities all culminates in, in a, a, a basket of a place where you put pen to paper and articulate, write down what your understanding is of your money laundering and terror financing risks posed by customers in the combination in combination with the products and the services that they acquire, where they are located, and how the product and service is rendered in terms of distribution to the customer. And this is what is called the Risk Management and Compliance Program. So section 42 of the, of the FIC Act places this duty on you as an accountable institution that you have to develop, document, and implement, and review a Risk Management and Compliance Program that we in short refer to as an RMCP. In this RMCP, you are required to explain the risks, inherent risks that you've identified and what you are doing about them to mitigate and manage and monitor the risks. So it is not good enough to just look at Section 42 of the FIC Act and jot down everything that it should cover in your RMCP. You have to customize it to the size and complexity and nature of your own business. Your business is unique. It does not look like the business of the financial services provider next door. Your target market, the products that you offer, the areas in which you operate, be it local, foreign, and when it's local, um, be it close to a border or in a high crime area, all of that are unique features. And you have to identify how these, these risks can possibly materialize and expose you for abuse in terms of money laundering and terror financing. And then on top of that, your customized controls. How are you going to deal with the risk? How do you identify it? How do you control it? How do you mitigate it? Um, because there is no such thing as no risk. Risk exists be it in a high or low degree, but certainly it's, it's never non-existing. So this risk management and compliance program of yours must be very comprehensive. It must be um, reviewed as frequently as necessary for it to be relevant. And it must enable you then as an accountable institution to identify your risks and to put you in a position to see the transactions, to, to take note of them, um, 
to, or to notice when your transactions or activities happen during the course of the business relationship with your customers that are in fact reportable to the Financial Intelligence Center. The first slide that Shaw opened with explained this, this framework and your role in it. And really, if we are not able as accountable institutions to understand our risks, which puts us in a position to control and mitigate it and to identify tr um, reportable transactions and activities, that link in that value chain then is missing and it makes the whole process null and void. It is sometimes difficult when you are just a newly approved FSP, for example, um, to start to draft a risk management and compliance program. But you need to be familiar with your duties, as we are discussing with you today, in terms of the FIC Act. And Charles also, in this, the, the one slide that deals with the pillars of compliance, explained to you all the guidance that is available and um, has been published by the FIC. And similarly, the FSCA has published um, several tools for you to use to assist you to start drafting and if already drafted to review your RMCP. It is then very important as part of the whole governance process of taking accountability for the RMCP to be developed, to be effective in its implementation and to be reviewed. That responsibility is on the shoulders of the board of the accountable institution and if you do not have a board because of the composition of your business, you have senior management, then this obligation and duty is on the shoulders of senior management. The board or senior management is required to take responsibility for the actual development and documentation and implementation of the risk management and compliance program. They are welcome to get help and assistance from outside to help them. It does not, however, absorb them from their responsibility. The accountable institution must, it's a duty, establish a compliance framework which in the development of this RMCP will take place, as well as the effective implementation thereof. It's very important to know that it's not good enough just to have policies, procedures and programs in place if they are not used or even if they are used, that they are not effective. The entire goal is to combat and prevent crime, and money laundering and terror financing. So if your program is there, it's documented, it's in a file, but it's no one knows about it, your staff doesn't know about it, at the end of the day, it cannot be implemented and you will not be able, it will not enable you to identify and assess and manage and mitigate and monitor the risks. Part of this governance um, process obviously then entails training. Your staff will not be able to implement what they do not know and what they're not aware of and what they do not understand. The training duty set out in the Financial Intelligence Center Act in section 43 specifically requires you as an accountable institution to conduct ongoing training on both the FIC Act as well as your customized RMCP to your staff. This again, like I said, it ensures that when people understand the duties, they will be able to implement the RMCP. They will be able to identify reportable um, transactions and activities. I'm going to hand back to Hamotso to explain to you what your duty in terms of registration with the FIC entails, as well as enforcement. Hamotso, back to you. Thank you, Michelle, ever so much. I have a better understanding now of the RMCP as well as governance and training obligations. Um, Shaw gave you a very important information on reporting obligations, the different reports, when and how to report. 
Uh, and the reporting platform that was mentioned by Shaw is the same platform to be used in order to provide registration related information. So in terms of section 43, capital letter B of the FIC Act, read together with regulation 27A of the money laundering and terrorist financing control regulations, accountable institutions must register with the center within 90 days. The FIC jointly with the FIC, FSCA have issued important guidance to assist institutions with registration, how and what to register. Also, a number of directives have been issued by the FIC as well in this regard. These directives are binding and enforceable. In terms of these directives, all registered accountable institutions are required to notify the center of any changes to registration details and to update same within 90 days after change has been affected. So if you've changed the name of your entity, such changes have to be made on the portal. Another one of the directives provides that accountable institutions must update their registration related information in order to access the Go AML reporting platform. So the Go AML reporting platform is a very important platform, not only for giving effect to the registration pillar, but also giving effect to reporting obligations. Thank you, Michelle, for changing the slide. Um, when I ask you, do you have an RMCP? Or I ask you if you're providing training, are you reporting any STRs, CTRs? Do you have arrangements, adequate uh, uh, governance arrangements in place? And your answer is no. Then, my dear friend, you have not complied with the FIC Act. We have established at the beginning of the webinar that the FSEA has the responsibility A, to supervise accountable institutions and B, the responsibility of enforcing compliance with the provisions of the FIC Act by those accountable institutions that are regulated by it. So where non-compliance has been identified during the course and scope of performing supervisory activities, appropriate enforcement action must be taken against the accountable institution for this non-compliance. In this regard, the FSEA is empowered in terms of Section 45C of the FIC Act to impose an administrative sanction on any accountable institution so regulated by it for such failure to comply with the provisions of the FIC Act. I would like to highlight, though, that it is important to understand that the purpose of administrative sanction is to incentivize compliance and to deter future non-compliance. So the sanctions that have been or will be or may be imposed by the FSCA should be sending a very strong message of deterrence that accountable institutions involved in non-compliance should not be profiting and should not be benefiting from such non-compliance. Therefore, our sanctions reflect the seriousness of the non-compliance and aim to deter it. Because at the end of the day, the threat or the possibility of a sanction being imposed should remove any incentives for choosing not to comply. Section 45, capital letter C, subsection 3 of the FIC Act, lists the following five possible administra administrative sanctions that the FSCA may elect to impose. Firstly, we could impose or issue a caution not to repeat the conduct that led to the non-compliance. Secondly, we could reprimand or admonish an accountable institution for their non-compliance. Thirdly, we may issue a directive to take remedial action. 
This remedial action could take the form of specific corrective actions or measures to remediate certain non-compliance that has been identified. Fourthly, we may impose a restriction or suspend certain business activities of accountable institutions. And lastly, we may impose a financial penalty, not exceeding 10 million in the case of a natural person and not exceeding 50 million rands in the case of a legal person. What do we mean by sanctioning factors or enforcement factors? Section 45, capital letter C, subsection 2, requires the FSCA to consider a number of factors when determining the appropriate administrative sanction. So we most certainly do not thumb suck these factors when determining a sanction to impose. The list of factors includes, but is certainly not limited to, the nature, the duration, or the seriousness and extent of the non-compliance, whether the institution has previously failed to comply with any other law, and thirdly, whether any remedial steps have been taken by the institution to prevent a recurrence of the non-compliance. It is important for accountable institutions to note that administ administrative sanctions by imposed by the FSCA constitute an administrative act and as such must satisfy the requirements for a just administrative, just administrative action as the FSCA is required to apply the promotion of Administrative Justice Act to any and all administrative sanctions imposed by it. So what happens after the FSCA has imposed the sanction? Publication. Section 45C, subsections 11 of the FIC Act requires the FSCA to make public any administrative sanction that has been imposed by it, unless the FSCA is of the opinion that exceptional circumstances or reasons exist to preserve the confidentiality of the decision to impose the said sanction. I would like to point out though that as a general rule, reputational damage is definitely not regarded as an exceptional circumstances as this is a natural consequence of publication. Also, an administrative sanction will be published by the FSCA after the expiry of 30 calendar days from the date of issue of the sanction, this allowing the sanctioned entity to lodge an appeal. In terms of the FIC Act, a, a sanctioned institution may lodge an appeal with the FIC Act Appeal Board. This is within 30 days of the notice of sanction being issued. In terms of Section 45, capital letter D, to get read together with the regulations, it sets out all of the processes involved with the appeal. It must be noted that the appeal board is a quasi-judicial body and has the power to confirm, to set aside or vary the administrative sanction that has been imposed, or even to refer the matter back to the FSCA for reconsideration. And lastly, the decision of the appeal board may be taken on further appeal to the High Court. I hope that accountable institutions now have a better understanding and appreciation for enforcement action. Thank you very much, Komoto. When we started also today with our discussion and we said we would like to share and make you aware as an accountable institution of your duties, we remain cognizant that as a newly approved accountable institution, you might have uncertainties, especially because there was that definitive shift away from a rules to a risk-based approach. And with uncertainty that may have been introduced in your mind due to the flexibility you now have to, to um, apply a risk-based approach, we do our best to assist you um, in giving you some tools to help you with your understanding of your duties 
and therefore improve the level of compliance behavior. To this um, point, the FSCA has an official website where under the regulatory framework banner, we have a dedicated AML CFT tab, and we encourage you to visit our website and, and click on this tab where you will find information again that will be for your benefit and to prove your understanding of your duties and make it easier for you then to comply with your duties. There's a variety of information like Komotsu mentioned uh, just now, such as the publication of sanctions issued. We have tools that help you to understand how to develop a, a, an RMCP. Um, it could be that you are not used to drafting an RMCP or you struggle with in including a risk matrix or you're not sure how to weight maybe your risk factors. These tools are, are available on our website to help you with that. Um, in addition to just highlight again with in terms of understanding your risk, your duties and complying with your duties really evolve around understanding of your MLTF risk. And to that um, point on our website is the sector risk assessment, national risk assessment, which should all be read by you to help you better understand your risk and take note of the red flags nationally and in this, the relevant sector that you operate in. The body of knowledge is also there um, with uh, frequently asked questions we anticipate and that we've seen over the years, as well as additional links with, if you are one of those people that like to read up more and broaden your understanding even further than just the basic, that is probably a, a good tool for you to use. And of course, if you're in doubt or you struggle, please, our door is open and contact us. We would like to assist you. Similarly, as Charles has already mentioned in that very important slide of the pillars of compliance, the FIC is doing very important work to further assist you also where you, doubt, you have doubts about what a certain regulatory requirement means or um, how it impacts your duty, what is expected from you. All the compliance um, guidance published by the FIC is available on their website, be it in the form of public compliance communications, the guidance notes, and then also the directives. And contact them if you struggle with things like um, finalizing and completing your registration on the Go AML system. They are definitely there to assist you. Visit their website and also become a frequent visitor to our website. Um, it will certainly just add to, to helping you in your compliance journey. I'll hand back over to Charles. Thank you, Michelle. Um, and I hope all of you have got a better understanding of what your compliance obligations are. Today's session was a high level overview of the compliance obligation. Certainly the onus is now on you to go and read the relevant legislation, to go and read the relevant guidance that have been issued on, on these issues to understand uh, your obligations better. We obviously also published um, more webinars on our YouTube channel uh, on various topics. So please go and look on more specific um, webinars that we've published. There are various ones that have been issued where we also explain some of the compliance obligations. I hope that all of you are um, in a better place to comply with the FIG Act. Remember, we'll be doing inspections as supervisory body to make sure that you are complying with your FIG Act obligations. There are consequences if you do not comply, as Kim also explained, and hopefully you are not one of those ones that we are imposing a sanction against. Enjoy your day and be, please be compliant. Thank you.